genetic screening of growing metastases and how it could reveal new targets. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. So over the last few years, we've been performing large-scale genomic characterization of brain metastases. And at this conference, I'll be presenting the initial results of our first data set. And the paper is actually coming out in Cancer Discovery tomorrow. So brain metastases, they are clinically devastating. They are the most common malignancy of the brain. They are one of the most feared complications of cancer. 25% of cancer patients will develop brain metastases. With the incidence rising, as systemic therapies and extracranial disease control is improving. And historically, we've had a limited understanding of how brain metastases genetically evolve from their primary tumor. And why is this important to us as clinicians? Many patients progress only in the brain and not systemically. The question is how different are brain metastases genetically from their primary tumors? When we make decisions about clinical trials and personalized medicine for brain metastases, can we rely on primary biopsies? We sought to further understand the evolutionary processes within brain metastases using massively parallel sequencing technologies. Our objectives were to, one, elucidate the evolutionary patterns leading to brain metastases, two, identify whether brain metastases harbor clinically significant genetic differences compared to their primary tumors, three, determine the extent to which clinically significant mutations are shared among regionally, anatomically, and temporally distinct brain metastasis sites, and four, determine whether lymph nodes or extracranial metastases are genetically similar to brain metastases and might serve as their proxy for clinical decision making. We performed whole exome sequencing of 104 brain metastases matched with primary and normal tissue from the same patient. This included 15 with additional sites, so including extracranial metastases and additionally regionally, temporally, and anatomically distinct brain metastases. Notably, these were all biopsy samples collected as part of clinical care. And this is the largest massively parallel sequencing study of brain metastases and primary tumors to date. We developed novel computational tools to perform an integrative analysis of somatic mutations and copy number alterations. This analysis allowed us to estimate the clonal architecture of primary, matched primary tumors and metastases and to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree relating subclones from each patient. Across all our samples and phylogenetic trees, we find that the data is consistent with branched evolution, meaning we detect a common ancestor shared by the brain metastasis and the primary tumor, but there's further divergent evolution within the primary tumor and the brain metastasis. How is this important clinically? We next ask the question of whether brain metastases harbor clinically actual mutations absent in their primary tumors. To answer this question, we annotated the phylogenetic branches of the trees from each matched case with clinically significant mutations or alterations that are associated with specific treatment opportunities in oncology. And we did in fact find that brain metastases are genetically distinct from their matched primary tumor biopsies. This is a representative example of a patient from, with a primary renal cell carcinoma diagnosed synchronously with the brain metastasis. The shared mutations are represented by the green line here, the gray line here, sorry. Mutations exclusive to the brain metastasis represented by the red line, and mutations detected only in the primary tumor sample represented by the blue line. mTOR and VHL are shared mutations here, they are in the common ancestor of the primary tumor in the metastasis, with a clear driver mutation occurring in a hot spot of PIK3CA only in the brain metastasis. Furthermore, there was also loss of CDKN2A, again, detected only in the brain metastasis, not in the clinically sampled primary tumor. When we look across all our samples, clinically actionable alterations were present on any branch of the phylogenetic tree. Here's a histogram of all clinically actionable alterations that occur in each case. Colors represent what branch they occurred on. Gray are shared by the primary and brain metastasis. Red, exclusive to the brain metastasis. Blue, exclusive to the primary tumor. Importantly, 53% of cases, more than half of cases, have a clinically actual alteration in the brain metastasis branch, 
not detected in the primary site. The most common alterations were those in the CDK pathway, or alterations associated with sensitivity to CDK inhibitors. 51% of cases had alterations predicting sensitivity to CDK inhibitors. Mutations affecting the PI3 kinase pathway were also frequent. Actual alterations in these genes occurred frequently in breast cancers, lung cancers, and renal cell cancers. So genetic divergence between primary and metastatic samples poses a major challenge to clinical decision making for precision medicine and oncology in brain metastases. What about regional heterogeneity within the brain itself? How representative of bulk central nervous system disease is a single brain metastasis sample? To answer this question, we sequence regionally, anatomically, and temporally distinct areas of brain metastases. And we found that clinically actual mutations were shared even in metastases in regionally, anatomically, and temporally distinct areas of the brain in the same patient. This is a representative example of a patient with a salivary gland ductal carcinoma who had a symptomatic cerebellar metastasis resected pre-whole brain radiation and a parietal metastasis resected after whole brain radiation. And we sequenced two different regions of the cerebellar metastasis and the parietal metastasis. Both regions of the cerebellar metastasis and the parietal metastasis were more related to each other than either was to the primary tumor biopsy and shared the same clinically significant alterations not detected in the primary biopsy. Metastases within the central nervous system are relatively homogenous. Given that central nervous system disease may be difficult to access in some cases, we then evaluated the extent to which involved regional lymph nodes and distal extracranial sites recapitulate genetic vulnerabilities present in CNS lesions. In this example case, we sequence a primary colorectal cancer, a lung metastasis, and a brain metastasis. The brain metastasis had more alterations that were unique to the brain metastasis, as depicted by the long red branch here, and we also observed an amplification in MYC in the brain metastasis that was not present in the primary tumor. So brain metastases are genetically divergent from primary tumors and other extracranial sites. So we demonstrate divergent or branched evolution. How is this important clinically? If one were to exclusively sample the primary tumor or regional lymph nodes for selection of the appropriate targeted therapies, one may miss potentially actual alterations in the brain. Our data show that clinically actual variants occur in the metastasis branch 53% of the time, presenting a significant challenge to the application of precision medicine to brain metastases. So when a patient comes to our clinic, the question is whether we can make clinical decisions based on a single primary biopsy resected five or 10 years ago, and the answer is probably no. So in conclusion, every brain metastasis displayed branched evolution. Brain metastases harbor distinct clinically actual genetic alterations compared to their primary tumors. All brain metastasis regions harbor the same actual alterations, and extracranial metastases were not a reliable surrogate for brain metastases. And I'd like to acknowledge many individuals and institutions who have contributed to this work, namely Tracy Batchelor, David Lewis, Gaddy Getz, and Scott Carter, along with many other institutions who have contributed samples and a lot of, uh, a lot of work uh, to this work. And thank you again to our, our families, uh, to our patients and their families. <laughs>